You are listening to Radio Alamundi. Hi there, wherever you are. I'm Marco Rixeker, a freelance writer, reporter, producer, teacher, translator, tour guide, poet, singer and songwriter. I speak several languages, and I'm the creator and founder of Radio Alamundi, an evolving podcast station where no language and all languages are spoken. It's a multilingual mix of music, poetry, lectures, languages, interviews, documentaries, recipes, and a lot more, co-produced with the students of the Alamundi International Cultural Center. You can find us on radioalamundi.bandcamp.com, podcasts.apple.com, Spotify, YouTube, Raker, Player FM, Facebook, Search, Radio Alamundi. The following narrative includes excerpts from a collection of testimonies and interviews entitled Let's Talk About It Anywhere in the World, where it is all about people's voices, accents, and speech patterns, hand in hand with my own personal anecdotes and observations. In addition to that, people are free to introduce themselves and speak their minds openly in their respective often indigenous, languages and dialects, without any paraphrases or expectations. So, let the story go on from there. As soon as I hear about the handcuffs, I am intrigued by their name. The Chicago band appears on my radar screen one day with their captivating and powerful music. So I reach out to the band on their Facebook page and get a quick response from Brad Elvis, one of the members and co-founders of the Handcuffs. He suggests that we do an interview together with his partner and co-founder Chloe Orwell. Both stand up for the band's timeless retro sound, which aims to reconcile the 1960s and 1970s with this day and age. At the same time, they fully assume their identity as a Chicago band, which is where they are speaking from during our online conversation, sort of between shows and releases during a busy period for the handcuffs. My name is Chloe F. Orwell, and I am in Chicago, Illinois. It's 5 p.m. Chicago time, which is central time. And I am in the handcuffs. I'm the lead singer and one of the songwriters. I also play guitar and saxophone and a couple of other instruments. And I enjoy all kinds of food. Very nice. Nice That's pretty much it. That's my only hobby is eating other than music, which isn't really a hobby. Ah, yes. Hi. And I'm, uh, <clears throat> my name is Brad, Brad Elvis. And uh, it's uh, eight o'clock where I'm at. No, it's uh, five, <laughs> 5 p.m. Central Time. And uh, I'm in Chicago as well. And also as well, I'm in a band called The Handcuffs. And uh, I'm a drummer and a songwriter, as so is Chloe. And uh, gosh, what else? I enjoy food. I like food a lot, and uh, water's good, and uh, (laughs) it's good to be here. From the start, is Chicago a predominant and recurrent topic of our conversation? Almost like a driving force, so to speak. And it is sort of a bridge that connects us, sitting at different locations in the world. Brad and Chloe are speaking from their home in Chicago. But it feels like all three of us are in the same room, sharing and swapping stories, jokes, and anecdotes. It's a dynamic that is enhanced by Brad's and Chloe's constant discussions and debates between one another, with my questions and comments being sort of a trigger. Sometimes 
It even makes me feel like I'm eavesdropping on a private conversation between the two. And it's not even always about music. It is about a cultural mosaic set in Chicago and how the handcuffs fit into it as a rock band with their own music. What is the recipe for your favorite Chicago dish? The recipe? Ooh. <laughs> As if we cook. I know. Um, that would mean we would have to cook. Um, well, I can make them. You know, the other day I burnt the jello when I was trying to. Um, no, that's a bad. Sorry. A recipe for a favorite. Can we just say the the directions to the favorite Chicago restaurant? <laughs> um, well, I mean, we like all kinds of food. We're really lucky because Chicago has an amazing variety of food uh, from all different cultures. Um, and I mean, I can't, I don't want to just name a favorite restaurant, but I will tell you that I absolutely love Indian food. I love Mexican food. I love Italian food. Um, Chicago pizza is not necessarily deep dish at all. Um, that's a tourist thing. We have amazing thin tavern cut pizza um and there you can get anything here there's an amazing array of foods and if you mm -hmm. like ethnic foods you will find it in any neighborhood yeah just go to a different neighborhood and it'll be uh the real deal yeah the real deal and you'll what? make friends too because everybody here um when you go to a to a restaurant they want to get to know you not just serve you food which is nice How diverse is music in Chicago? It's it's diverse. I mean, there's kind of the same deal. Right? It's yeah, the right? same deal. I mean, I'm not sure it's as ethnically diverse as the food is, but it's certainly diverse in style. Although there is there are plenty of different, uh, you know, ethnic festivals. Um, in fact, the neighborhood where we live, which is the Albany Park neighborhood, um, boy, it's like the most diverse neighborhood in, in, in this, in the city, I think. I mean, I think that's, that's like a proven thing. Um, and you just the other day we were sitting on our patio and somebody had like a mariachi band in their backyard, just playing music, which was pretty great. Um, because you don't get to just sit in your backyard <laughs> in Chicago, Illinois, or, or anywhere in America and just hear some, and just hear a mariachi band, just playing live it was like and a live band it was a live band it was amazing um but there's there's a there's a big variety of you know chicago is probably best known for blues and jazz in you know the early days um but boy there's so much um pop music and rock music and blues of course and jazz of course and indie and americana and folk um you kind of get it all here. There's not one style, um, even, you know, country music to some extent. Oh, um, I'm sure, there's yeah. like a big sort of country scene here, rockabilly scene. Yeah. Which part of you guys is Chicago? Oh, you had given a really good answer in an interview and I can't remember what it was about Chicago. Um, like we're, we're, where Chicago is, is tough, but kind, I think. Um, and part of it is that we have really um, very robust seasons here. So it's very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. Um, and we have to sort of adapt easily. So we we're very tough, but because we're also in the Midwest, we're, we're kind, I think. Um, Because we have to deal with all of that, you know. We right. To deal with, we just can't. Every day of the year, we just can't just walk out on the patio, and you know, winter comes, you got to like shovel snow to go to the store. You know, you got to deal with it. You right. got to deal with stuff. And you and, and you then, often will help out a neighbor who's digging their car out from the big snowstorm. Yeah. So we have that in us. Um, and I also feel like going back to sort of the cultural significance, we are exposed to so many different kinds of people here. Um, we're a melting pot. Chicago is a big melting pot with a lot of neighborhoods. Um, and although some of those neighborhoods are 
are, um, you know, very sort of homogenized. So there might be a Korean neighborhood and a Mexican neighborhood. And um, we still are exposed to each other and we, we learn a lot from each other. And I think that gives us tolerance and kindness, but because we're city folks and we have all this weather stuff, I think we're tough. Tough, but kind. Does that phrase describe your music then? Kind of. I would get, I would add a little quirky in there too, maybe quirky, um, accessible. Those that sort of describes us also. I think I, I do talk on occasion. Oh, sorry. She's doing such a great, <laughs> I'm really she's doing a lot. such a great job. So how musical do you feel today? Uh, well, like you said, every day, I mean, we wake up and, uh, uh, I know I, I wake up and I look at my, look at Facebook because it's such a good place to, uh, connect and meet people and see what's going on and hear news and, and share things. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, I see, you know, people asking to do interviews or someone writing and saying they just bought our album. They really like it a lot. And, and, uh, so that's always a good thing to wake up to. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm always sharing music and, uh, and uh, I put up my, uh, my little silly cool rock pick of the day. <clears throat> I do that daily. I do one pick a day and it, it's interesting because <clears throat> I try to pick something, you know, tomorrow will be something completely different, but the thread will be of comments. I always learn something from it. Like people have some story or, or some insight that I didn't know about. So that's always a good thing. It's a, you know, learning and sharing music and, and friends, unfriending people. And, and I will <laughs> so, <laughs> blocking people, blocking um, people. I will say you're, um, as long as I've known you, which has been a long, which is a long time, you've always either been humming a song or either a song that you're creating in your head or something that you heard recently or something that you just thought of from a record you heard a couple days ago. Um, you write music almost every day, even if it's just a, a riff. Um, so you're pretty musical every day. Maybe, I mean, I'm musical, but I think you are more, you are more prolific musically than I am on a daily basis. That does is that quite make, possible. Does that makes sense. That is very possible. Yes. What have you guys been dabbling into today so far? Well, um, I, <laughs> I mean, well, we, we promoted our show. Yeah, we we did promote our show. I invited a bunch of people to our to our new show um, coming up. Um, that's the, the coming up this Saturday in town, and. Um, you know, I talked to our publicist about, you know, there's other things, but it's, it's, there's more than just the music part of music. Um, I was communicating with our publicist, um, who's lovely and wonderful. I communicated with our record label guy um, about the show this weekend. Um, and I will say that we're lucky because we have really good relationships with those people and like them a lot. So it's actually a joy. And that's part of it is um, doing just some of the busy work and business behind it. Um, I also do uh, voiceover work as sort of my day job. And so later I will go downstairs in my studio and I will do some auditions and edit them. Um, but to me, that's also sort of part of my music. Um, it's just using my instrument uh, as a different type of creativity. And I do uh, drumming, drum sessions on recording sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not as much during COVID, of course, but um, the pandemic. But uh, just today I was contacted by uh, someone that I had played on their recording just a couple years ago. And uh, it's going to one of the songs is going to be on some benefit oh. uh, CD uh, for the Ukraine Oh, nice. And uh, for Ukraine, they wanted to. Yeah, they wanted yeah. to send me a copy of it. And they were thanking me for playing drums on it. And, oh, that's great. And, uh, I, did so not, just, I did not know that. Yeah, it was a Michael 
uh, Mazda. Oh, great. That's yeah. wonderful. So I think, oh, great. That's cool. So just things like that come about and uh, somebody writing and saying that they wish that we were playing in their area. And yeah. And uh, so it's ongoing. Any independent musician and artist knows that there is a lot more to take care of than just the music and art they create. And the same goes for the handcuffs, who don't have a manager or agency to deal with promotion. Feedback is what it is all about between promoting and performing. Yeah, it kind of, uh, I mean, you got to do the business end of it, you know. I always say it's almost like you're you're owning your own little storefront, you know, and you got this new business and you can't just sit there and wait for people to show up. You got to put a sign out front or you got to advertise and you got to uh, make sure that your product is good. And, you know, it's, it's and like that. You're that. good to your customers. And and good, yeah. yeah. Like we, we you want to build your business and you want to be successful with it. So. Uh, a lot of times you end up doing the stocking and uh, and uh, the all, yeah all the work you know right until you, it gets going so and you know even when and to sort of on the same um, train of thought um, when you're playing a show like sometimes our a lot of times your fans become your friends um, you know and vice versa and so when they come to your show you know, especially at a smaller club, um, you sort of, it's almost like you're welcoming them into your home where you're entertaining them and you want to make sure they have a good time. So um, there's that sort of added, it's not pressure, but it's, it's an added uh, element to it where, you know, you're, you want to perform and you want to do your best for you because it's your creativity and your creative outlet, but you also want to make sure because those are the, that's the reason we do it is so that people will engage and will see you and will like you know hopefully like it or we'll have some sort of uh um you know response to it um and so you do you know you do have to there is more to it you do have to put put a lot into it um to make sure that the people you're doing it for appreciate it and are and are appreciated you know the feedback could also be a source of inspiration for you. Oh, um, absolutely. That's yeah. so, I mean, there are shows that you come after the show, you, you feel so invigorated, not because you did, you know, you feel like you played really well, but because the audience was so responsive and you kind of felt their love being thrown back at you. Um, and that's really, and that's really lovely. I mean, it's a, it's very human. It's very, it's very connective. It's very communicative. That's why I my theory is is one of my theories. Uh, one of your many theories, and I'm very serious about it. <laughs> um, is an example I think is like the Beatles, and they they quit touring because it was just crazy at that time, like night after night after night after night for a couple for however many years. We can't do this anymore, and we we're uh, being creative and wanting to be in the studio more and produce stuff. Which is they did, and of course, then you know, Sergeant Pepper came out of that, and and some other things. But then it started getting weird, you know. They started kind of having tension, and uh, as the albums went on, and they never played live, and but that's what they grew up doing, you know, as a rock and roll band and the people, and but now they're in the studio for a couple of years. So if if you pay attention to you know the uh, sort of the, the performance on the, the rooftop. I don't know if you saw the Get Back documentary, the real long documentary of that. But even if not, if you saw Let It Be, whatever, um, there's this tension. But they go on the rooftop and they're playing to like 30 people. And it's and all of a sudden they're like kids in a club again. Hey, and they're looking at each other and, and smiling. And they and look and like laughing. they're really having fun. And they're kind of like, oh, yeah. I messed that line up. Right. Yeah, you know. Right. And, and they're just having fun. And it's, so it's such a human. And they're getting this response back from the people. There's 20, 30 people yeah. on the roof, you know. And uh, just that, I think they were all like, that was great. That was so fun. You know, they were being all animated and and trying and. This is like a night and day difference from studio. And then yeah. all of a sudden they're, 
it didn't have to be thousands of people. It was just a handful of people up there. Yeah, you know? and I can say that it it's often, you know, some of the best shows you've, you know, we've I've played, you know, might there might be 50 people there. There doesn't have to be 300 people. Um it's to, to get that response and that, you know, chemistry. Describing one's surroundings in a visual manner is one thing. But a description of the immediate soundscape around them is something else Chloe and Brad end up giving me. What's the coolest sound you've heard recently and how could you play it on an instrument? Ooh, that's, I like that question. Um... The coolest sound I've heard lately, and how could I play it on an instrument? Can you think of anything? How about the ringing in my ears? <laughs> um, you just follow that. Though. Um, I mean, there's so many sounds we hear living in a city. Just live, just in our neighborhood, we hear sounds. Just the we actually the uh, Haleta sky with his little bell. One of our albums, uh, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, remember, there was like a, it wasn't a car crash. It was some kind of screeching thing. And we found out about it. And then you came in, you had heard it. And we tried to recreate it. In yeah. The studio, and we put it, I'm not laughing or one of those Yeah, songs. it was like a screeching or a siren what was it, it? like it was like a street like a car thing that she had heard yeah she said, man i got this idea i heard the sound of this car this... yeah it was Some like weird... a, it wasn't a crash no i wouldn't have like wanted this, that's it like too this... morbid but um like i think it was on our yeah second, like the second album second album May first. sorry that we're being so vague but yeah, yeah. but we've had that experience but we actually used before. that but, but we but I'll hear like the like like the Paletas guy. He there's a guy that comes down our street like almost every day in the summer, and he's got a and it's like a bicycle bell, but it's different. It's like a it's almost like a like a ding ding with a woo 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 kind of a bell that he that he rings. And I play sax, so I guess I would want to try to maybe emulate that on sax somehow. But I don't think I could really get it because it's such a specific sound and it really evokes. I know that that's what it is. It's very Pavlovian. <laughs> like I want to go get a popsicle when I hear it. So a discussion with Chloe and Brad about the name of their band is quite inevitable at some point. So what's the story of your name? It's it's a little... Um, it's not as cool as we would hope, but it's basically was Brad had thought of the name. Um, we were just thinking, we were just trying to think of a name that was catchy and memorable and sounded sort of rock and roll. And Brad thought of the handcuffs and he, we weren't, we're, well, we're married now, but we weren't then. And we weren't living together yet. And it was just us. And it was just us on too. The song. So it was we just, didn't have a band yet. We were sort of trying a new thing where we were just going to be the two of us and doing some studio work and trying to evolve into something different. Cause we liked all different kinds of music and we're, we're sort of burned out with what we were doing before. And um, he called me and he th said, the handcuffs is great. Cause it's like you and me, it's two people. We're sort of handcuffed together by creativity <sighs> You know, and um, and it's also kind of sexy and edgy, and then and, I and timeless and it's timeless, good, timeless rock and roll um, name, you know. And then once, and then we googled it extensively, and nobody had it, which we couldn't believe. So we trademarked it, and um, and then we got married, and the name for spouse in Spanish is the same for handcuffs. So we thought that was kind of cool. So we were married. Uh, and then, um, and now we're, we're married to our band basically, which we have four, other, uh, three other members who are amazing, but, um, but it started out as um, and in, ending up with the word for, for spouses, the same as handcuffs was pretty cool. I thought um, we didn't mean that we didn't do that on purpose because we, but I've, I thought of that at the time because we were together musically. Yeah, yeah, we were, yeah. 
So anyway, it ended up being a great name. Um, and now we're like a five part, five piece handcuffs, which is sort of Escher like weird. Actually, I was so fascinated by the name of Chloe's and Brad's band that I even looked up the word handcuffs on Wikipedia. During our conversation, I read an excerpt from the article to them. They elaborate on it for a bit before we associate the band's name with their music. Handcuffs are frequently used by law enforcement agencies worldwide to prevent suspected criminals from escaping from police custody. So, Brad, Chloe, how do you like them apples? <laughs> I mean, obviously we know that handcuffs are used for that, but is there anything in that article that handcuffs are also used by lovers for to spice things up? No, but we told, you know, and, and the other thing is like, I almost feel like we were obviously very um we're both you know bleeding heart liberals so we obviously don't obviously lot you know there are some people we're super happy to see in handcuffs um <laughs> who have broken the law but obviously we know that 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 law enforcement um has done some terrible things lately um and we also kind of feel like we're taking that back the handcuffs are are making sure that we, you know, are not represented representative of terrible things law enforcement. It's criminal, does. really. Right. No, so, no, no. but yeah, but I mean, you know, it's it is it, yes, we we are aware of that. And the handcuff and and also when you google handcuffs or the handcuffs, it's a very common word. So, um that is the that is the risk you take when you have a band name that's a common word, you know. We might have to change it to the cuff links. Yeah, because there would be nothing to Google about. Yeah, no, but yes, you're right. The mm -hmm. yes, that that's a good point. But we are we are aware of that, and we um we try to we try to do better. Let's put it that way. How does the band name reflect your music? Um, I mean, we consider. I mean, it reflects our music in that maybe. Um, also, handcuff seems like a very Chicago word to us. Also, there's like a, a, a company that makes handcuffs and they're called like Chicago handcuffs. Um, and it, they like manufacture handcuffs. And is um, that the ones that sent yes, us handcuffs? Yes. Years and they, ago. they actually sent us Chicago of, handcuffs. We had like, out of one the day. Blue. We, what's this? We got right, a box. A and they saw our name and thought they would send us a, bo a box of, with a pair of handcuffs in it, like a heavy duty. Crazy handcuffs, but yeah, it's kind so, of funny. So our name gets out there. I guess. So, um, you know, again, go, going back to the, we think it's sort of an edgy and sort of sexy name. Um, and that kind of, I mean, describes our music a little bit. And our music also, especially for this album, um, has a feel that's not necessarily Chicago. Although the, 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 album name is definitely Chicago related um, and artwork and artwork is definitely Chicago related. But, you know, we also feel like we have our influences are um, sort of, you know, 197 early set 1970s England and maybe New York City and, and maybe a little Chicago. Um, we have some of that Chicago's kind of pop sensibility in mm -hmm. our music where it's catchy and riffy. Um, but we also were listening to a lot of early 70s English music, glam, English kind of, um, you know, rock and roll from that era, New York rock and roll from that era. Even the title of the Handcuffs' most recent album at the time of our conversation sounds cool. And it is closely associated with the typical Chicago phenomenon that I just have to ask them about and which they explained to me in detail. Well, the name Burn the Rails um, comes from when it's really, really cold in Chicago, they um, set fire to the commuter 
train rails to keep the ice and snow off so that the trains can run. And so you, if you, if you are sometimes, especially at night, you can see if you happen to go near some commuter rail tracks or, um, you know, like at a, I don't know, train yard, you'll see flames on the, on the rails and it's really crazy looking and it's, and it's, I, I don't know if they do it many other places. It's definitely a Chicago thing and everybody who lives here knows about it. And it's just, it's very well, dramatic and plus, apocalyptic looking in a way. Plus in Chicago, uh, the trains, it's such a hub of the United States for trains, especially back in the day. Uh, yeah, I think it's out by O'Hare Airport or somewhere in that area. Mm. Uh, I remember crossing over and it's just like, like hundreds of tracks like this big area, you know, and uh, so anyway, a lot of tracks, a lot of trains, and uh, it keeps the snow and ice off of it. And uh, it's just really interesting. It's such a Chicago thing. So we thought, oh, burn the rails. That sounds like a good, also sounds like a rock and roll name, you know, it sounds like a. And it also sort of came to mean finishing the record during the pandemic um, because it was it was a lot of it was a struggle and it was it was hard. Um, because the world changed and um, not just for us, but for everybody and a lot of our friends and colleagues. And it was it was a really rough time for everybody. So we just we all had to just burn the rails together to get through it. To which degree does the music in that record burn the rails? Uh, all of it. <laughs> I know I love that. <laughs> a somewhat deeper discussion about the music the handcuffs make is given sort of a personal anger with opposites and phrases. What are your two most opposite influences? Opposite influence, gosh, see, I feel like there aren't opposite influences in music. I feel like you can, you can find something, I mean, I don't know, maybe, you know, polka and, uh, and, not, Bo- and, and not Bollywood or no, something, sure. you know, but, but even then there's probably some kind of a relationship if you really delve into it. Um, so I can't answer that question because I, I don't think there are any opposite influences. And in again, with, and kind of our music as well, there's kind of a story that the reason that Chloe and I met as a, uh, that's a whole long story, but uh, <laughs> I was looking yeah. for a, a band uh i was looking for a mate not a personal mate but a, a, music, a, band, a music, musical, musical mate to uh because i write songs and i want someone to play guitar and and uh so i put an ad in one of the local old tiny ad like in a in a yeah in the reader you know the reader so sure. yeah yeah back when it was like this thick you know not not when it's this thick and uh <clears throat> so anyway one of the qu- one of my influences, I said, oh, looking for this, looking for that. And one of the things that I, I said, if, you, if you're if you into this, you know, call this number. And uh, one of them was, the, Be- <laughs> was the Beatles White Album. And because the White Album is just like all over the map and they're all over the place. But and, it still sounds like the Beatles, but, yes. but it's still, in, it's very, uh, di- it's a diverse record. But there's everything in there, like... You know, there's country kind of stuff, and there's rock and roll, and, and there's heavy stuff. Sort of classical influence. Classical. Things. There's some jazzy moments. There's some. Uh, it's the Indian. In, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so that album was a big influence on me and my song and me. And then so Chloe answered right. answered the ad, and uh, we got to talking, and and that was she loves the so the we white, both love the white album. Yeah. And to answer your question, that it's, and to answer her answer, <clears throat> right. that, you know, I think there's not really that many opposites. You can use everything. And that's why our albums have a lot of influences all over the place. You know, yeah. we're not just like one, one or two kind of the songs. And that's all we ever write. You know, we like writing all kinds of different songs so have I mean we you know we're definitely we play saxophone and jazz stuff and uh we're definitely you know a, a rock band we're a rock band um and we have a sort of a specific this record particularly a sort of a glam rock 
glam rock, rock and roll record. But we absolutely would listen to things that you would not even think would have any relationship with this record to get inspired. So kind um, of prog music. Might listen to something proggy. Country, or, country rock. Yeah. Stuff. So might, we might, you know, there's nothing Johnny Cash like about this record, but we would listen to that just to get some inspiration. Um, and maybe one little thing will kind of hit us and go, oh, that's or, something that I can use in my head for creativity for this particular song or even sounds yeah you know, sounds. Certain particular sounds yeah. or a, a way a certain uh album was mixed yeah for that genre mm-hmm. that would fit one little part of one of our songs you know it's like oh, how did they do that you know on yeah that, you know so yeah it's all one big happy family yeah so if we can say i got the blues why can't we say i got the punk You can feel punk. You feel punk. <laughs> That's actually something that I actually say, I feel punk. Which means I feel a little, either a little off or a little angry or a little sick. You know, I feel polka right now. <laughs> I'm going to poke you in the nose right now. Oh, boy. No, oh, boy. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm trying to think of other words like polka or blues. Yeah, no, but yeah, you can't. I feel like punk, you can feel punk. Actually, we say that. That is sort of a phrase that you and I say. My grandpa used to say, oh, I'm feeling a little punk, Bradley. Yeah. Hmm. Your grandpa was cool. Music in general, the feedback from an audience, and whatever makes a musician happy are some of the other topics Chloe, Brad and I explore further on during our conversation. How do you create something out of nothing? Well, it's like any artist creates something out. It's like any kind of art, whether it's visual art or audio art. It just, it just comes. And I don't know if anybody can explain it. It's like you got to... You know, uh, out of nothing, you're you're there, and you want to fill that void, and uh, and rather than eating a bowl of spaghetti, <laughs> uh, you th- at least I do. I think of uh, you know, I was enough. I'm sitting around. I'm there's music in my head all the time, and I'll hear like a drum beat or a, or a riff or a piano or a guitar. And it just starts there. And it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. Then I just keep building with it. And uh, so a lot comes from that void, I think. Filling the void. Yeah. That's the name of our next record, maybe. Filling the void. Yeah. All right. Maybe. How practical is your music, actually? I think for some people, it is. it might really be part of their daily ret- routine. And for other people maybe maybe a little goes a long way and that's okay um because everybody has their own way of um accepting art and hearing and seeing art so i can't answer that i think that answer is for ev- for each individual listener and any answer they say is okay with me that's well, about our, our own music yeah well I feel that, and probably goes for both of us, obviously, um, we write songs that make us happy, because that's the first thing. You don't want to write a songs and record an album that you're not happy with. Right. Or a way it's produced or whatever. So we're hands-on, <clears throat> and uh, we get it exactly how we like it. It's almost filling that void of uh, creating something that we're super happy with. And, and, you know, I hate to say this, but if no one likes it, that's fine because I'm really happy with it. And I could listen to it every day of my life and like, yep, that's exactly what I wanted to do there. And uh, this and that. So it's kind of that way also with uh, live performances, you know, doing what we do and playing. And uh, uh, you just hope that, someone else gets it and mm-hmm. likes it just as much as you do. And maybe it'll carry over. And, uh, and they're like, Oh, I totally get this. So that's uh, the reward 
of being an artist is someone liking what you're doing, you know? And if they want to listen to it every day, great. If they want to listen to it once a year, great. However it makes them, however it moves them. But that's the payback. Yeah. You know, that someone likes what you're doing, what you've done that you've, or they, you've created. You or know? they feel, or, or it gives them, it moves them in some way. It gives them something to feel. How cool can it be to be able to share your own happiness with the public? Yeah, and, and it's actually very cool to share our own happiness with the band. The, the band, um, and I should mention who they are, Emily Togney is our bass player, does background vocals. Allison Hinderleiter is our keyboard player. Jeffrey Kamisiak is our lead guitar and also does some background vocals. We all love this record. We love the way it turned out, all of us. We talk about it almost like like a therapy session or a support group where we're really happy with it. And the fact that they're super happy with it and they like it and are proud of it and just feel really good about just listening to it themselves is really rewarding because you do this project with people um, and we all really like each other and get along and are kind of a happy family anyway. But, you know, you're still dealing with five different people and five different personalities. And it's it's something that I think I almost think this particular record almost brought us closer because we yeah. we're all so happy with it. And we all put so much into it that made us feel good. And, um, it, and it seems like people are picking up on that whole connection. Like the, yeah, like, like the connect- chemistry we have. It's like doing a ball it. of energy. Yeah. There's a nice, a positive ball of energy that uh, people are being positive about. Yeah, that I think that they do pick up on that. It's almost like the, it's almost like our joy playing live together almost came across on the record, um, which wasn't live, which was produced in the studio. Needless to say, that humor is a permanent presence as well. There aren't any particular jokes just the spontaneity of interacting with each other. In the process, we explore music in general, the handcuffs as a band, and the music they play, and again, all things Chicago. In addition to that, there is the fact that most artists and musicians wonder which of their creations future generations will remember. What about the future? How would you like to be remembered by future generations? Um, Just, it'd be nice if uh, someone a hundred years from now discovered a CD and said, wow, this is really cool. Or vinyl. Or or vinyl. vinyl. Or or music somehow. And and it's like, wow, this was really cool. This was ahead of its time. (laughs) <laughs> that's what I want them to this say, a good, even though you that are, this has a really good feeling about it. I really like the sound, the sound of this and the, and, uh, and it has a good beat and I can dance to it. And now. it sounds, no and it sounds good in my spaceship. Yeah. That's what I want someone to say. So the handcuffs do belong to the 21st century. Even if Chloe and Brad mentioned the music of the 1960s and 1970s a lot. And don't references like that give their work a retro touch of timelessness? We'll discover records just going record shopping and it's usually like vinyl and we'll put it on and we're like, God, this is so ahead of its time. This is so, this so sounds like almost like the future, not even now, like what they were doing. Um, which, which which is maybe why it didn't sell back then yeah or whatever it was like, which because it was too it creative for its own good or too ahead of its time or too futuristic or something well actually on this on our new album <clears throat> this is our fourth album and we wanted to um kind of get you know even i i hear like uh young younger people young kids and people our age whatever talk about bands from the early 70s that they just discovered some of them like yeah. the younger people like oh you're 15 years old what do you listen to 
Led Zeppelin. Right, a lot of, we hear a lot of that. You know, or Rolling Stones or (laughs) Mott the Hoop or, Mm -hmm. oh, I got this David Bowie album or I found this Kinks album. Dad, have you ever heard of a band called the Kinks? You know, that kind of, I hear stories like that all the time. (laughs) And it's true that people, and then people also say, like, you know, people our age or whatever, they'll say, oh, they don't make music like that anymore. Oh, that music was so great. And you can go back and listen to it. It's like, ah. So we're like, why don't we make an album like that? Almost like it's this lost album, you know, and uh, bring it into the. But still with the little modern edge. Yeah, bring it into now, but still production wise. And and uh, we kind of wrote songs like that anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> so it kind of has that vibe, almost like it's a lost record from anywhere from 1970 to 1974, 75. It's in that pocket. Yeah, is what we were shooting for. So it's got a little vibes of Led Zeppelin and early Stones and uh, Mott the Hoople. And T-Rex. Some, T-Rex. Yeah. It's all in there, but it's still the handcuffs. So. And having said that, I do want I do need to add this disclaimer. We do not believe that the best music was old music. We like we think there's plenty of great modern music, right. like awesome music that I'll hear some lizzo song or something and i'll think god i wish i would have written that that's a great song so um we're not we're not fuddy duddies about music no not at all but But, yes what you said is yes but it's true that but there are a lot of that a lot of really good new music nowadays is also influenced by great music from the past please tell me why am i not surprised that you do vinyl Um, and it's all part of the. It's part of the. It's all part of the goal of that of this particular album. Too. Yeah, it's, it's like, like the, so. It would be so perfect to be on vinyl, for what it is. And yeah. all of everyone in the band is also we're we're all we all really like vinyl records. We all um, we collect records, all of us, and we like going record shopping. We like going to record stores, and um, we. So it was just sort of part of the process and the evolution of this record was like of course we're going to put it out on evil, vinyl evolution the evil in man's evolution man's um evolution. so now having said that this the vinyl is not going to be out for months because there's supply chain issues so um but yeah we just we we just were never there was never a question that it was going to be on vinyl so maybe we'll do an interview again with you when it's out on vinyl in six or seven months so This conversation has taken many an unexpected twist and turn, and Chloe, Brad, and I have discussed many a topic. Which song of yours would best illustrate this conversation? Love Me While You Can. Big Fat Mouth Shut. No, no, no. no, no. I would say Love Me While You Can. Uh, Yeah, that's a good one. Um, This conversation. I think Love Me While You Can. Yeah, would will illustrate this conversation. Okay. Uh oh, he has to get. He's getting the record. Okay, let's look. Oh look, it's Marco. Oh, oh I know he's in our. He's on the picture. Oh, I want to. Can I mention one other thing? Sure. I do want to mention that we had one of our heroes from Mop the Hoople. We became friends with him, and it's a long story. But he played on our record. He played on two songs on our record, and um. It was amazing and uh, wonderful. Um, and, it, and of course, Mata Hoople is a big influence. So Morgan Fisher, uh, who was the keyboard player for Mata Hoople back in like 1974, and also played with them on the reunion tour through um, a few cities in 2019, he played on two songs on our record. So I, I definitely wanted to mention him. Um, and it was a pleasure and a joy. And sometimes when you meet your heroes, it's absolutely delightful. And they were, uh, he was in one of our videos. Oh, yeah, he was in album. one of our videos, too. We did three videos for our record. Yeah. So. I would say Love Me While You Can, don't you Love think? Love Me While You Can, Come On, Hey, Hey. Oh, Come On, Hey, Hey is actually, ooh, yeah. Actually, that's another one. That's that, why I had to look on the... Um, Come On, Hey, Hey is also... So those two songs are the ones that I think would be best. <laughs> He's good oh, promo. Like, it's, yeah. a, it's a little gatefold. Definitely. And it's a little gatefold, yeah. Eventually... It is time for the usual poetry reading performance at the end of my interview with Chloe Orwell and Brad Elvis of The Handcuffs. Most of my conversations end this way, 
and in this case, both are excited about the opportunity to take turns, stanza after stanza, to read a Carl Sandburg poem. I have chosen it because at the beginning of Killers, Carl Sandburg uses the word handcuffs in a way that Chloe and Brad might identify with. They do, and even rehearse the poem for a bit, trying to figure out how they will take turns. And their voices breathe new life into Carl Sandburg's poem and give it an extra touch of poignancy. That pretty much sums it all up for an interview that has turned into an encounter. And we all do hope that there is more to come. So, the story goes on from there. Killers by Carl Sandburg. I am singing to you. Soft as a man with a dead child speaks. Hard as a man in handcuffs. Held where he cannot move. Under the sun are 16 million men chosen for shining teeth, sharp eyes, hard legs, and a running of young warm blood in their wrists. And a red juice runs on the green grass, and a red juice soaks the dark soil, and the 16 million are killing, and killing, and killing. I never forget them, day or night. They beat on my head for memory of them. They pound on my heart and I cry back to them, to their homes and women, dreams and games. I wake in the night and smell the trenches and hear the low stir of sleepers in lines. 16 million sleepers and pickets in the dark. Some of them long sleepers for always. Some of them tumbling to sleep tomorrow for always fixed in the drag of the world's heartbreak, eating and drinking, toiling on a long job of killing. 16 million men.